Hi there, esteemed audience, and welcome to another episode of Middle Grade Ninja. I'm your host, Rob Kent. As you know, I'm the author of the Banneker Bones Trilogy, and you can get that first book, Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees, as a paperback, an audiobook, or the ebook is free. Free to download whenever you're watching or listening to this, wherever fine ebooks are sold. So go get your hands on that. Uh, for more information about the show, interviews with thousands of literary agents, editors, authors, all the best people, head to middlegradeninja.com. Uh, and I couldn't be more excited. Uh, today I am chatting with none other than Robert Beatty. Robert, how are you this evening? Great. How are you? I am really excited to be talking to you. Okay, good. Uh, well, been, I'm, I'm really excited to talk to everybody that comes on the show, but I've been uh, uh, absolutely uh, falling in love with Willow of the Dark Hollow. So I've got lots Thank of great you. questions, uh, hopefully, for the, about that uh, and about everything that you've done up to this point. Uh, so esteemed audience knows I never summarize anyone else's biography or anyone else's book. And hopefully that makes sure that I still have friends in the publishing industry. Uh -huh. uh, so my first question is always, please give esteemed audience kind of an overview of your background. Uh, my background. Okay. Uh, well, the brief version is that I'm a full-time writer. I write books for uh, Disney Hyperion. Uh, the book that I just launched last week is called Willa of Dark Hollow. Uh, prior to becoming a full-time writer, I had a full-fledged corporate career. I was a uh, entrepreneur and a internet uh, software CEO. So I had a full life, but I, through all of that, I wanted to write and I've been writing for many, many years. And eventually when I had the opportunity, I shift to writing full time. And then Willa of Dark Hollow, my newest book is about a young girl. She's not She's not exactly human. She is uh, 13 years old. Her name's Willa. And she has uh, many magical powers. She is something called a Farron. So she lives in the deep in the forest of the Great Smoky Mountains. And she has many abilities and capabilities that are related to the forest. She's very interconnected with it. So, for example, she can camouflage her skin and to the surroundings that are around her. So if she's hiding in a bush, her skin isn't white or black or brown or yellow. Her skin shifts to the green, the green leaves that are around her. If she hides next to a tree, she uh, looks like brown, uh, craggy bark. And she also has the ability to speak an ancient Farron language that all the animals of the forest understand. So uh, she can touch trees and make Make them grow spontaneously. So has, she is what's called a wood witch. So she has these powers related to the forest. So Willa of Dark Hollow takes place in 1901 in the Great Smoky Mountains in a true historical setting. It's a combination of history, mystery, and magic all sort of blended together. I guess uh, my first question for you. Um is with a character like that, who I, as I came to think of her as kind of like a little bit poison ivy, a little bit Aquaman, but she can talk to the animals all around the forest instead of the creatures of the sea. With yeah. somebody that powerful, and I realize, spite small spoiler, I guess, early on in the first book, she gets shot with a, with a shotgun. Um, but aside from yeah. that, how do you find obstacles for somebody so powerful? Well, she doesn't start out real powerful. Uh, you mentioned the first book. So Willa of Dark Hollow is the second book. Willa of the Wood is the first book. Now, if you've not read Willa of the Wood, that's okay. You could just start right with Willa of Dark Hollow. It's written in such a way that you don't have to read the previous book. You can just start, start right into the story with Willa of Dark Hollow. So it's an independent story. But in Will of the Wood, she definitely does not start out real strong. She, in fact, starts out uh, in quite a weak position, and she learns to develop her skills over time. So her grandmother has... Uh, taught her the ways of the, the wood witches of the past. And uh, so all her skills and training come from what her grandmother has taught her. But 
uh, then some things happen and she has to venture out on her own. And so she has to figure out a lot of things along the way. So she, she in fact, does not think of herself as powerful at all. Uh, for example, unlike my previous series character, Serafina, uh, Willa does not fight. She does not have claws. She does not have sharp teeth. She does not uh, use weapons in any way. She never hurts anyone or anything. She's very uh, much a pacifist, a vegetarian, very linked to the world in which she lives. And so one of her challenges is that there are industrial loggers coming into the region, cutting down great sections of the forest where she lives. And these are what she calls men of iron, meaning they have uh, steam powered cutting machines and skitters and draggers, and they use giant locomotives and so on. And she has no a real strength or weapon or, or way to fight the men of iron. So that's one of her challenges. So with a, um, a companion novel, because um, I, I uh, started with Will of the Wood, and I heard you say, well, you don't need to have read the first book to, to read Will of the Wood. And I said, okay, well, uh, I'll, read, I'll read some of both. Uh, yeah. And then I'm, I'm wondering, as I read Will of Dark Hollow, it, it starts off, I didn't have any trouble following it uh, if I hadn't read the first book. But there are some slight spoilers, I think, for the first book in the second book. Um, yeah. How do you write a companion novel specifically to avoid a sequel? This, this takes place one year after the first book. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So I would say that in the re there are spoilers in the reverse direction. So in other words, in Willa of Dark Hollow, if you read that one first, when you go to Willa of the Wood, you will already be familiar with some of the things that are going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and is that, uh, are you planning, uh, I know that you had recently signed a contract for a three book deal. Um, this was, was one of them and there's a one yet to, yet to be revealed still. Any chance yep. that might be yet another Willow book or can you even say at this point? Uh, let's see. It was actually a four book deal. Oh, even better. <laughs> yeah. So it was a four book deal, that last deal. Uh, so it was, Serafina and the Black Cloak, and then a two book deal and a four book deal, as I recall. One was for a fourth Serafina novel, and then two Willa novels, which are now written, and the, Ser the fourth Serafina novels written. And then the fourth a book in that contract was a yet to be determined middle grade novel. And that's what I'm working on now. So, uh, I can't share the title yet because I've not fully decided that it is the right title. I have a working title that I'm just kind of working with, but I uh, haven't fully confirmed it yet. Uh, but it is also a middle grade novel filled with history, mystery, and magic. But it is, and it also takes place in the Great Smoky Mountains and the Blue Ridge Mountains where I live here in Asheville. And uh, it is the same universe or same world, but a different moment in time to my other books. So it actually takes place in contemporary or modern times. So when you eventually do some time warping and bring them all together, Avengers style? Or... Uh, it was my original intention that Willa and Serafina would meet and the, the two series would cross over and they would be in books together. Uh, in fact, in Willa of the Wood, I don't know how far you've gotten thus far, uh, but in Willa of the Wood, Serafina and another character from the Serafina uh, series do appear in one form or another. And I don't want to spoil anything for anybody of either series, but and astute readers will definitely recognize characters from the Serafina series. And so whoever the mysterious character is for this new book that you're working on now will hopefully eventually join them? Uh, possibly. It, it's definitely feasible within the universe I'm creating. Uh, when you first start reading this, this new book I'm working on, you wouldn't see how that could happen. But by the end of it, you can see how it will all work. Yeah. 
And One of the complications, okay, so I said this was my original intention because I would like to bring the characters together, but it is complicated by some new developments, and that is that Willa of Dark Hollow and Willa of the Wood are, we're currently turning them into a television series. So a live action, multi-season television series. And so because of the way that's coming out and the way that's set up, that's the Willa series. And then they'll be, uh, we're not as far along on the Serafina adaption, uh, mostly because COVID disrupted all of our plans, but those currently are two different studios. And so it's hard to bring them together when they're two different studios. So that I'm trying to write the books in a way that it will work well with uh, the television series and or movies as well. And you're an executive producer on the Willa series, right? That's right. Yes. So as executive producer, I mean, how much uh, control does that give you? Do you come in and say, I like what you wrote here. Unfortunately, I'm the guy. So we're going to change all of that and do it my way or. <laughs> uh, no, not like that. It's more like what I asked for was to be on the team with the writers, sort of be in the room and to be able to persuade them, it, have the option of trying to persuade them. If I saw something I didn't like, uh, I have the option to speak with them and talk to them and try to convince them to do it otherwise. Uh, but that's a rather negative way to think of it. Uh, the, the other way I think of it is I'm just part of the creative team that's working on the concept art and the characters and the casting and the writing and so on. And so there's a team of three writers. They're all excellent writers. And so they uh, call me and uh, we do Zoom calls together and they pitch their ideas and we talk about it. And I'll say things like, yeah, that's awesome. Do that. That's very, I, I was going to do that, but I didn't have room in the book for that. So yeah, go do that. Or I'll say, uh, no, that, that sounds really, that's not going to be consistent with Willis character. And we'll talk about that. And so they've sent me uh, what's called a script outline. And I wrote lots of notes for that. And so we're just a collaborative team at this point. But I wouldn't. I do not have control of anything. I'm just more of a advisor. So I know that you uh, kind of collaborate with your wife Jennifer as well as your daughters, right? You, you've described these as a, a kind of a family project. Do they get involved with the television writing as well? Uh, they do, yes. So they, when I read the script outline or the scripts, they read them right along with me, and uh, th and they give their opinions, the, the good and the bad, and I kind of gel that all together and then communicate that to the team. Gotcha. So I don't know if you're able to comment on this, but I, I, I would think we are you doing like maybe one season encapsulates the story of one book so you've got another season ready to go and then come season three it's time to think up a new willis story or yeah so what we're doing is uh book number one willa of the wood is going to be two seasons and then willa of dark hollow book two is going to be the next two seasons and if it's going very well then i'll write a, th a third willa book to give us more seasons Gotcha. And I had read that Amy Adams was expressing interest or her company was expressing interest. I don't know if she's still involved at this point. Yeah, uh, it's beyond expressing interest. She's attached. And so she is the other executive producer. So it's myself, Amy Adams, and uh, then the, the what's called the showrunner or lead writer is the other executive producer. So the way it works is that Willow of the Wood and Willa of Dark Hollow, the, basically the entire Willa series, however big it becomes eventually, uh, was acquired by Entertainment One or E1, which is this massive uh, conglomerate that produces many of the TV shows and movies that we see uh, in film today. And then they bring in what's called, a, they're the financing studio. So they're the executives and the sort of overall decision makers 
And they bring in what's called the production company. And the production company is the people who actually do the work. They uh, hire the director. They, they hire the writers. They uh, work on the location, the sets. And then they are the ones that do the work. So Entertainment One has is collaborating with uh, Amy Adams's company, which is called Bond Group. And Bond Group is Amy Adams' new production company, and Amy herself is the executive producer uh, on the show. Obviously, you're an executive producer, so you're going to have some influence on this, but do you have at, at this early stage any like dream people that you'd like to involve? Like My dream is I don't care who stars in whatever adaptation they do of one of my works, so long as Hans Zimmer writes the soundtrack, we're cooking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah have, I'll uh, take Hans Zimmer. Know. Definitely, definitely. Uh, no, I don't have any dream uh, requirements like that. The main thing is, and I'm also very flexible. For example, uh, running a, a show, a live action television series for multiple seasons is a lot different than, than a novel, right? So in terms of the pacing and the, and the content and so on, it's going to be a little different from the book and that's fine. That's great. I'm all for that. You can add in fact, more material than what's in the book. And I'm excited about doing that. But the main thing I really am trying to protect and that I'm most concerned about is to retain what I call the themes of the story and Willa's character and the things she would and would not do. Um, so I just really want the story to be very consistent with the book, not in terms of the plot or the actual scenes that happen necessarily, but the themes and the, the gist of the story and, you know, the themes being girl power and connectedness with nature and uh, the complexity of solving large problems and staying bold when facing those big problems and so on. So I don't want anything to, I want to reinforce those themes, not abandon those themes. Got gotcha. you. So you can blow it up as big as you like, make it, you know, 20 seasons. Uh, knock yeah. wood. <laughs> but so long as you're staying true to that, you're going to be a happy camper. Yeah, right. That makes sense. Uh, and then um, going uh, back just a little bit, because I'm trying to square something in my head as I've, as I've been reading over everything. I'm like, this is a man that must just be a force of nature. And I think esteemed audience, uh, if they don't already have a sense of this, will maybe get a sense of this as we talk and kind of go over just some basic facts about your situation that I look uh -huh. at. It, wow, this is a man that he's he's got. He's got some kind of ability that you don't do anything halfway. And when you do something, it, it, it's amazing. So I want to kind of go back a little bit to the beginning. So, so here's something that kind of blew my mind. You get a typewriter at what age of 11, and that's when you start doing a bit of writing. But then you get a, a, a T99 personal computer from your father, and you yeah. teach yourself to code in your, your program with six languages before college. That's right. So when I was about 11 years old, I uh, was reading books and I, you know, I wasn't a real strong reader. I didn't learn to read real fast. I wasn't super good at reading, but I just loved the stories. I loved experiencing stories. So I'd sort of hack my way through uh, whatever book I was reading, but I used to love like the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit and the Once and Future King and the Book of Merlin and sort of those European uh, fantasies, right? And one day I ran out of books to read and my mom said, well, there's a typewriter in the closet. Go play with that. That were, Those were her exact words. Go play with that. And so I put a white piece of paper in the typewriter. And up to this point, all I'd ever seen was these novels that I'd been reading. So I just typed chapter one and I just started writing my first story. I just immediately fell in love with it. I thought, okay, reading's cool, but writing is awesome, right? I just really awesome. wanted to tell stories. And I love stories that were in movies and television. I love stories that my dad would tell around the campfire. I just, and I love books, of course. And so I just love stories. And so I started writing and I thought, 
you know, I, I put my heart and soul into that first book. I finished my first novel when I was 11. I thought it was going to be awesome, but it wasn't. It was really badly written. Uh, the only person I could get to read it was my mom. And she read it and she gave me some pointers, told me what she liked and what she didn't like. And so I, you know, very fiercely was like, right, okay, I'm going to do better. So I wrote another one and another one and i just kept writing books and i would give them to my brothers and my friends and just anybody i could get to read my books i would give them and then i would the and the deal was read my book and then i'm going to interview you afterwards and i would say okay what did you think was happening here and how did you feel when this happened and did you get this when this happened and where were you bored or where where did you think you where were you excited and so i would basically uh interrogate whoever read my books and that's how i learned how to write or taught myself how to write was by trial and error and by listening to the reader's experience they didn't tell me how to write a sentences or a sentence or how to create a plot but they told me what they were feeling and thinking at each step of the book and i used that to understand how to improve that book but also how to improve my writing ability my writing craft so for years i just kept writing book after book after book and Are loved it full length books yeah, yeah, I only wrote novels. I never, I, I maybe have written two or three short stories in my whole life, but I've written many more novels than that. So I'm really a novelist much more than anything else. And at that same year, my dad who used to work, he was like a middle manager in a big power company. And he took me into this giant room where he worked and he showed me this big giant metal thing with lights on it. And he said, that's a computer, that's the future. And I was like, wow, this thing's awesome. And so after that, he got me this, this TI-99, which is similar to like a Commodore 64. And I just started playing around with it, learned how to program on it. And then I connected with my math teacher who had a, a teletype uh, linkage to the university mainframe. So I started uh, programming in basic on that. And then by the time, and then all through junior high school and high school, I just, any language I came near, I would learn it and master it and just fall in love with it. So Pascal and Lisp, which is a artificial intelligence uh, language, and just kept learning and learning, just loved that area. So by the time I said, okay, I got to go, to, I'm going to go to college now. I decided to study mechanical engineering rather than computer science because I already knew six computer languages and thought, okay, I can keep learning this on my own, but I want something to go with it. So I studied mechanical engineering as well with uh, more or less a minor in computer science. And so through all this time when I was at, I was in engineering school, uh, struggling through my calculus classes but at night i'd be writing fantasy novels in my dorm room that's that's what i i did for fun uh when i wasn't doing my homework and so then i joined a manufacturing company i was an engineer and a software programmer and uh i ended up creating a software program that effectively took control of that entire company, uh, tracked its inventory, tracked its people, did all the accounting, just did everything in that company. And eventually we decided to take that concept and pull it out of the company and I formed my own company. And so I became the founder and CEO and chief architect of an internet software company where we developed uh, the very early stages of what today is called cloud computing. And this was business to business cloud computing. And so this whole time though, I was, so I was the CEO of the successful software company. I had all these awesome programmers working for me. We were having a great time and I'd get home at night. I'd get home at 10 or 11 or midnight and I would work on my book. That's, I just loved working on my novels, no matter what else I was doing. So I've done many other things in my life, but the thing that I've always done is to write books. 
And I've got so many follow up questions there. I have <laughs> no well, one question I had uh, right away when you were loaning out uh, typewriter copies. If your brother is reading that, is that the only copy that, that he's holding in his hot little hands? Yeah. Not, yes. <laughs> yeah, I'd have to give it to them and then pass it to the next person. Yeah. yeah. Monitor, make sure they're not eating anything while they're reading. Not, right, with, yeah. that, uh, not with this book. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. And, and, and obviously you're not, I mean, you're, you're CEO of the company. You were what, 2007 Entrepreneur of the Year. I have the year right on that. That's right. Mm-hmm. So you throw yourself into that, and then at some point you get you get hooked up with Narrative Magazine specifically to learn about story, right? How does that work? Well, I was at a point in my life where I was writing books but had not yet successfully published, and I was the CEO of a software company, and I thought, okay, I, I'm not succeeding here. What can I do to... Uh, get my books published. And so I say, okay, what are my assets here? Uh, one thing I'm very short on time, right? Because I'm running a software company and, and I also had a family. And so I, I said, I'm very short on time, but I, because I'm a CEO, I do have some money. So maybe I can use uh, kind of use those together. And so I, one of my great passions at that time was Hemingway. I had read all of Hemingway's books and I loved Hemingway and I was studying how he writes and why his books are effective. And there were particular scenes that I thought, now this is really well done. I want, that's the spirit of what I want to be able to do. And so I was Googling around and I found the the last editor of Hemingway was still alive. Not Maxwell Perkins, the famous editor of Hemingway, but somebody who had worked on his very last published book. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And so I contacted him and said, I, I want to work with you. Will you uh, will you work with me on my writing? He said, uh, I don't take a lot of students, but send me your book. Send me your current manuscript and we'll see. And so I did. And then he called me back uh, a week or two later. And he said, I love your book. I will definitely work with you. And he was the founder and editor of Narrative Magazine. So at that point, he became my writing mentor, and he then became a close friend. And then he said, hey, we're having trouble with the Narrative Magazine uh, website and the system. Can you, you know, I know you're a tech person. Can you take a look at it? And so I looked at it and said, yeah, you need a database on the back end of your your website here. And so we, I joined Narrative Magazine as the chief technical officer to redesign what's called the content management system, the thing on the back end that, that pulls in all the stories, that takes in submissions, that publishes the stories, does handles all the editing. So think of like a management information system for the publishing industry. So we developed that at Narrative Magazine, and then eventually they asked me to become the chairman of the board of Narrative Magazine. And so I did that for several years, and that whole time my goal, besides just to help the magazine, was to learn the publishing industry and learn what was getting published and not published, and to learn from my writing mentor. So that's that's my involvement with narrative. Eventually, it, it started taking over my whole life, and I eventually had to say, okay, this is flipped now. Instead of helping my writing, it's taking up all my time. And so I eventually decided I had to back off from narrative and, and focus on my books instead. So, uh, I'm assuming none of these books that you're working on up to that stage are Serafina or the drafts of Serafina. That's yet. correct. The, uh, this is all prior to that. So somewhere so, there is like an entire collection, just a treasure trove of, of Robert Beatty novels that we maybe could get our hands on or maybe you could get published. Is that right? Uh, there's about 15 novels that I wrote prior to Serafina. And but so any plans? I mean, no, there's no plans to publish any of those. 
yeah, none of them are good enough. So I, I would like to say every novel I've written is awesome and amazing, but it's not. I just, it took me a lot of practice and a lot of time and effort to finally get to the point where I could write books that, that people enjoyed reading. And there isn't anything you could go back and kind of just rewrite a little bit into something. Oh, yeah, there, there is. And I do do that. For example, sometimes people say, where'd you get this idea for Seraphine and the Black Cloak? Why a black cloak? What's the big deal about that? Well, remember that first book I told you I wrote when I was 11? Guess what was in that book? It was a black cloak. So I've just always loved, I don't know why, but I've just always loved the mystery and the power, the idea of a person wearing a black cloak. And so that is an idea from when I was 11 years old. And it's just kind of traveled through maybe different iterations until you found right. the perfect home for it. That's right. And the same with Willa and other characters that are there. They're, they're, they are pulled a bit from the past, not, not entire plots or entire books, but little ideas here and there, definitely. Good. Hopefully we've pulled a steamed audience back from the edge of despair. If they're thinking, my gosh, 15 books before you get to a good one, we'll be like, hey, that's all time wasted. No, no, fear not. <laughs> yeah. Now I know it's, I don't, you're the first person I've ever said that number to, I think. Uh, I don't want to scare people or discourage people. Many people have written their first novel and gotten it published. Oftentimes, it takes several novels uh, before you get published. But the main thing is just to focus, if you're a writer, the main focus is just finish a novel, just, just write a book. And then if you still if you're still alive at that point and you still have enthusiasm for it then write an even better one after that so and then uh many people get published well before the books that the all the time that i took to get published i just started at a spot where i just was not a good writer at all and i just had to practice my skills for many many years so I'm trying to, you're, you're um, exhausting me just a little bit, just talking about all the things that you've yeah. done. You've got this hobby that's becoming chairman of the board of an entire magazine. Yeah. CEO. Did you find yourself bored as a young person in, in school? Did you, did you need more of a challenge than was provided and so you sought one out? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I, I'm not a particularly good student. I didn't get awesome grades, either in grade school or high school or in engineering school. Uh, I, it's it's not, let's see, anything I've done doesn't come from intelligence, if, if that makes any sense. I'm not what you would call a highly intelligent person. What I am is focused and I work really hard. And so in the case of writing, you could also say I'm determined, meaning I didn't give up. And that's one of the themes in my books. Uh, in Serafina series, it's stated explicitly. And that is the phrase that the characters say to each other is stay bold, meaning stay courageous, stay strong. Even when you face very diff difficult obstacles, and it seems like you're going to fail, or even if you have failed, you stay bold, stay strong, and you keep going after whatever your goal is. Now, in the case of Serafina, her goal is to, you know, stay alive, not get killed, and to save her friends, and to save Biltmore Estate, and so on. In the case of Willa, it is to save the animals and save the people that she loves, to save the forest that she loves from the loggers and from the dark uh, forces that are coming into the forest. But in my case, the stay bold was to keep writing and to not give up because, you know, I received many, many rejections on those early books and many other people would just give up. They would just say, well, I'm not a writer. I'm just not born to be a writer. And I didn't believe in that idea. My thought is writers aren't born, they're made. I'm going to make myself into a writer, even if it takes me many years to do it. 
And I should point out, you were also a, a champion fencer uh, while, you're, while you're doing all of these other things. That's right. So you also not in... half, half do anything. You must put your whole heart into every fact. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I was, uh, I played with swords like broomsticks and things like that when I was in high school. Again, remember, I read a lot of medieval fantasies. And then I actually, uh, when I went to university, I, in my very first term, I joined the fencing team, the kendo team, and the what's called Society for Creative Anachronism, also known as SCA. And these guys dress up in full plate armor and fight with broadswords. And I joined all three of those because I was really into sword fighting and, and that sort of thing. But eventually I realized that fencing was really where I wanted to do. So I dropped the other two and just focused entirely on fencing. And it was really my great passion in university. So I got a degree in engineering, but when I was there, my mind was really very much on fencing and on the books that I was writing at the time. Yeah. So I was a saber fencer, which is a highly competitive, very aggressive sort of uh, fencing weapon. Uh, the foil fencers thinks, think the saber fencers are barbarians uh, because it's such an aggressive sport. But uh, I really, uh, really enjoyed it. And I, there was a point where I thought, OK, I love this so much. I don't want to become an engineer or a software programmer. I don't want to do that. Instead, I want to be a full-time fencer and become a fencing maestro. So that was one of the things that I really wanted to do, but I, you have to follow. Unfortunately, you have to choose a path and you can pretty much only follow one path. And so I chose to continue on with engineering and writing. Who taught you to be bold? Oh, good question. I'm not sure, actually. Uh, I imagine my dad, uh, but it wasn't any explicit or specific incident or, or inspiring discussion or anything like that. But uh, uh, in terms of my family, I would think I'm the most like my uh, dad. But then my brothers, I have three brothers. Uh, they were also very much a part of raising me. You ever come across something that you wanted to do and just found it to be too hard and stopped? Uh, right up to that stopped part. So I have found things that were too hard for me to do, uh, but I keep trying and then I would uh, eventually get good enough at that area that I could succeed in it. So to give you an example, I wanted to be a, uh, an engineer. And I, but I wasn't very good at math and I didn't take calculus in high school. I'm not even sure if it was offered, but even if it was, I was not a good enough student to be in that class. But the first thing you have to do when you go into engineering school is to take about two years worth of calculus. So I failed my first calculus class. And at that, as many, many engineering students do, and they just drop out of engineering and go into something else. I just said, okay, I'm going to take it again. So I took it again and got a four point on it. And then I said, okay, I'm going to take calculus too. I failed it took it again, got a four point and so on. So I'm, like I said, I'm not very smart. I'm just very determined. And you're doing that while thinking I'm going to eventually become a professional fencer slash novelist. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. So I follow my passions for sure. And then you go on, you meet your wife, Jennifer, in a writing workshop. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So, uh, it was a situation where I had uh, graduated and I was uh, execu an executive at a company. You know, I was, a, I was wearing a suit and tie every day and somebody said, hey, there's this really good writing professor giving a class downtown. You should take it. And I said, OK, I'll give it a try. And so I went to this class and my uh, it was really funny because my friend at the time said, I predict that you're going to meet your your future wife at this class and i just thought that was funny and we laughed about it and so i went to the workshop it was a writing workshop and i remember the very first 
uh, session, uh, the the professor said, okay, does anybody have any chapters or stories or anything they'd like to share with the class? Nobody did because they just showed up at the class for the first day. Uh, but I said, here's the first few chapters of the novel I'm working on. And so he said, okay, everybody, th this is what you're gonna read next week, come back and we're gonna critique Robert's uh, chapters. So, at that first class, I look all around and I look at all the women and I'm just like, man, I don't see her here. I, I don't, I don't see, <laughs> I, I, you know, my friend said my wife was going to be here, but I don't see her. And I just can't imagine going out with any of these girls. And so I uh, went away disappointed and I told him he was wrong. And so at the next workshop the following week, I showed up and everybody gathered around and they're all telling, they're all talking to me. And there's maybe 20 people in the class. They're all talking to me, telling me what they thought about this chapter that I'd written. And they're like, Oh, I love this. And I love that. And this part was cool. And, you know, so everybody's focused on me. And then at the back of the class in walks this girl and as soon as I saw her, I just thought, oh, there she is right there. And I just knew right then. And she came over and she had missed the first class because she had uh, enrolled late. And uh, after that, we just became friends and we started going out together and fell in love, got married, had kids. So. So she didn't critique your story the first that, that first no. session. Yeah, the only reason she even noticed me was because everybody in the class was talking to me and telling me what they thought about the book. And so she was, of course, she's like, Well, who is this guy that they're talking to and saying all these things? And uh it was pretty funny because she she came up to me afterward and said, can I get a copy of your story? Because it sounded like everybody really liked it. So I'd like to read it. So that's how we met. So we spent the le rest of the workshop uh, critiquing each other's work along with the other students, but also secretly kind of moving closer to each other during the class. So is that sort of... Um, in I don't know, set the mold for the release. That's not the right way to put it. But does that does that set kind of a pattern? Because I know that she edits and, and helps you with your books even now, right? And somehow you, you've stayed married and raised a family. So you yeah. found a way to do it peacefully. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's part of our process. So she has always known me as a writer and that's always been part of our relationship uh she's also a good writer but that's not her main thing uh she she was taking this class to complete her degree um but uh sh she's more of an artist illustrator and she's very good at that and so as I continued writing, uh, we just got in the habit that she would always be my first reader and give me feedback. And so, you know, like I said, I've spent my whole life listening carefully to my readers and their experience. And she became very articulate and very clear about and in her ability to communicate to me what she was thinking and feeling as she was reading my books. And then she she gets ill, but she's she's cancer free now. But she she fell ill, and that was the moment where you decide you're not going to be a CEO. You're going to become a full time writer. How does that transition? Come yeah. So um, so this was in about 2005 or 2006, and I was running my company and loved it. I was working 80, 90 hours a week. I thought this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, and that I would die happy. Uh, except for that, I felt like a failure because I hadn't published a book yet. But uh, in terms of my corporate career, I was very happy and satisfied and thought, I, you know, I'm good. I'm just going to keep growing my company. It's going great. And then uh, my wife got cancer. And that was just like a sock in the gut. You know, that really hit us hard, as you can imagine. It hits everybody hard. And it really reminded me that, you know, there's more things than just working on your company, right? There's other things. There's your wife, there's your young daughters, and there's other things beyond that as well that you want to do with your life besides just 
your corporate life that has been my focus for many years at that point. And so I got an opportunity where I uh, was in a situation where I was able, I had an option to sell my software company. So I decided to sell my software company and uh, I uh, exited the company pretty much 95%, but just stayed involved as a technical advisor and remained as the sort of honorary chairman of the board so that I could uh, help with the transition. Uh, and then I shifted to focusing entirely on my young daughters and on my wife. My wife, uh, thank God, is now cancer-free. She went through chemotherapy and radiation, and uh, she's been cancer-free for years now, so she's all good. And then during that, as I, you know, I thought, okay, I have more time now because I've sold my software company, and I started focusing more and more on my writing, and my uh, at that time, I was because I was an adult and had been an adult for many years. I was writing books for grownups to read, and it didn't even occur to me to write books for a young audience because I had been uh, writing books for adults for many years, and so. I was busy, busily writing my book when there was a knock on my door and it was my daughter, Camille, and she comes in and she says, hey, dad, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm working on my book. And she said, can I read it? I said, oh, I'm sorry. It's, you wouldn't like it. It's not for kids. It's, it's just not appropriate for kids. And so she went away kind of sad. And then she came back a little later and she said, dad, can I read your book now? And I said, no, I'm, I'm sorry. You can't. And she went away sad. And um, Camille is not to be thwarted. So she doesn't want to, if she wants something, she wants something and she's not going to be thwarted. And so she comes back to me and she brings an old manuscript up and it's about two inches thick and it's, and it's typewritten. And she puts it on my desk and she says, what's that? And she points at, at it in a real accusing fashion, like I had hid something from her. And I, said, I looked at it and said, wow, where did you get that? That's a novel that I wrote when I was like 12 years old or something. And she said, oh, I found it in an old box in the basement. And, I, and she said, I just read it and I loved it. Write more books like that. And that really got my attention. So I thought, wow, here I have been struggling to write these books for adults. I wonder if I just stopped doing that, if I wrote, if I took all the skills that I had developed over the years, because I've been writing for like 30 years at this point, if I took all those skills, but wrote a story specifically for Camille and her two younger sisters, and had a female protagonist that was Camille's age. And if I used my current skills, but wrote a book for her and her sisters, I wonder how that would feel. So I put my other project away. And the next day I said, I'll just try it for one day and see how it feels to see you know, how it feels inside. So I just started writing and it just immediately was the most awesome thing that I had ever enjoyed doing. I just, as soon as I started doing it, I thought, this is what I was meant to do. This, this is me when I'm 11 years old with Camille being 11 now, but I have 30 years of practice. So I'm able to tell a good story at this point. And so, uh, but, you know, up to this point, I'd only been rejected. So I was really terrified that Camille and her sisters would reje effectively reject what I had, what I wrote for them. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to get them to help me write it. That way, if they help me write it, they're, they'll be more likely to like it, right? <laughs> and all this was a strategy to make sure I wasn't rejected by my own daughters. And the, so we came up with these ideas. We started brainstorming. And I would write the chapters, and my daughter Genevieve, who was about nine at the time, she was severely dyslexic, so she could not read what the chapters I was writing. So I started reading them out loud to her, 
and to her sisters and to my wife. And they would listen and they would give me real time feedback verbally uh, as I was reading the story to them. They would say, oh, this part's awesome, dad. Keep doing that. And damn, this part's boring. Just cut this out. Or this is too scary. Or this isn't scary enough. Or that's cliche. I've read that a million times or whatever. They are brutal, uh, very honest critics, but they come up with lots of cool ideas. And it really got our creative juices going. And so that book, uh, it took us about a year to write it, uh, which was fast, uh, but that book was Seraphine in the Black Cloak. So I took the manuscript to what's called Thriller Fest in New York City, which is this giant a festival where thousands of authors come and try to get picked up by maybe 20 agents, right? So you, you stand in line, they ring a bell, you sit down, and you have three minutes to pitch your story to an agent who's heard every story under the sun. And at the end of the three minutes, somebody rings a bell and you've got to leave. So you've got to convince this agent that he wants your story, your novel in three minutes. And so I, uh, they, the managers of the conference said, you know, we know rejection is hard, but it's better if you pitch your story to at least two or maybe even three agents. Well, I pitched my story, Seraphine of the Black Cloak, to 10 agents that day. Because as I said, I'm always, you know, I'm a hard worker. I'm ambitious, right? If I want something, I go after it. And so I pitched it to 10 agents. All 10 of them said yes. Prior to that, I had never heard anything but a no. So I had done many pitch conferences and heard hundreds of no's. And this time I had 10 yeses all at once. And so for Wait, the first time in my life, what happened? What, what was the difference? Yeah, so I researched all those 10 and picked the agent that I thought was the best. And uh, so he read the book and he loved it. And he said, I want to represent you. And so then he started taking it to the various publishers and then Disney Hyperion acquired it. That's so a, a phenomenal difference. Do you know what you did that day that you hadn't been done doing before that you suddenly everyone's yes? Yeah, I, I can tell you the difference. And my wife, Jennifer, was really instrumental in helping me figure this out. But by this point, I could write a sentence. I could develop a plot. I had good settings. I had good descriptions. You know, I was a decent writer and everybody would say that. Even the people who rejected me would say, you're a good writer. No. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like, okay, wait, wait, wait. What do you mean? Uh and so what I was missing was that close connection to the point of view of the character. In other words, I was writing as if I was a camera watching a movie, seeing a character go through actions, which sounds good, right? It sounds good. It's like, oh, your book's like a movie. And I had watched a lot of movies, as you can imagine. And so my book was kind of like a movie, but it was told in an objective way, in a descriptive way, kind of like the way an engineer would see something, right? What we really did to make it so much better was to get way down into the character's mind. And so uh, the first line of the book, Serafina opens her eyes and looks out into the darkness and she goes hunting for rats. Uh, she's a rat catcher in the basement of Biltmore Estate. And so everything is told very closely from her point of view. And so when she walks into a room, it's in the past, I would have said it was the largest room in Biltmore Estate. It was 150 feet long. It was 75 feet high. It had a vaulted ceiling, you know, this kind of thing, right? Instead, it was when Serafina, Serafina walked into the room and its ceiling was so high that a, a hawk could have soared through it. Okay. You see the difference between those two things? One's objective and, and detailed and denotative. And the other is subjective. It's from her point of view. It's, and so I just really started getting down, deep down into the point of view of the character. So with Willa, for example, 
when she sees a log cabin, she doesn't say log cabin. She says it's a lair where the humans sleep. And she doesn't say it has wood walls. She says, keep in mind, she loves trees and she is friends with trees. She says the lair of the humans was built on the stacked carcasses of her friends. Okay, so to use words like stacked carcasses instead of logs, uh, that is the subjective point of view of Willa. And so that was really the, the turning point for me as a writer, is I, I didn't start with anything, but I eventually developed the ability to do the other basics, you know, plots and pacing and so on. But the last piece of the puzzle was this subjective point of view and really, really close third person point of view. Yeah, I checked out the lumberjacks didn't have sap on their hands. It's tree blood. Oh my goodness. Yes, that's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So when Willa sees people with sap on their hands, all the verbs I use, all the nouns I used, I use are the same verbs and nouns that would normally be used to describe murderers and death and humans. So for example, they would cut the limbs from a tree. Okay. And notice the word limb uh, we have limbs, but trees have limbs as well. And so every word I would choose was based on how she thinks. So, uh, and I love the idea that the, the whole family is involved. I know you all work together on the, on the book trailers as well. So that theoretically, uh, when your daughters look back at their childhood, they'll, they'll be able to look at each of these books and that will spell out a, a story of how they grew up, right? Yes, very much so. Uh, especially for Genevieve, I would say, because Genevieve, my middle daughter, uh, she played Serafina in the book trailers. You know, so when she was 12, <clears throat> we, we produced that first book trailer. Uh, we produced it ourselves uh, using resources here in Asheville, North Carolina, where I live. Uh, and uh, we... Uh, Genevieve played Serafina and Camille, who I've already talked about, she played one of the other characters from the second book called Lady Rowena. And so we, my, my wife made all the dresses and costumes that you see in the book trailers. So yeah, it was a big family project, just like writing the books. I've got to ask, 30 years of, of feeling like a failure, despite uh, objectively being a huge success as a, as a CEO. <laughs> I mean, they gave you uh, awards. I assume they meant it. <laughs> so, <Yes. laughs> you're doing well there. 30 years, 15 books. And then uh, Serafina comes out and it's what? It's on the New York bestseller uh, list for what? 59 weeks. Am I right about that? Yeah, it's 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 69 now. But yeah, so uh yeah, so I went from rejections for 30 years to uh, number one New York Times bestseller, bestseller. And so, in fact, we, it hit the New York Times bestseller list in the first week and then went up from there and eventually got to the number one spot. In fact, all six of the books that I've published thus far, including Willa of Dark Hollow, I'm happy to report, are all New York Times bestsellers. So if you want to, if you're a writer and you're discouraged and sort of down about your chances and so on, just understand you can have a lot of failure and those failures are your stepping stones. Those are your instructions to get to the point of success. And when you were uh, writing the first Serafina novel, you didn't have anything worked out with, uh, with the Biltmore uh, as far as promotion or anything. But then once you get your Disney contract, you go and you, you do that. And I guess they sell uh, Serafina fla flavored ice cream or, or some kind of themed ice cream now. As yeah. well, as there. Uh, well, Biltmore doesn't. Uh, the local ice cream shops do. They okay. sell a Serafina ice cream and a Willa of the Wood ice cream. And uh, But Biltmore does, let's see, when I started writing the book, I had no relationship with them. But once they uh, read the book, they really fell in love with it. And we became good friends and allies. And uh, so we work together now. Now and they're still good friends today. 
on paper, it looks like, wow, what an amazing coincidence. Robert Beattie never stopped believing and everything worked out. But I have a problem with coincidence. And I, I believe that you've thrown yourself at this uh, full hearted uh, and have made this happen. I don't know if you manifested it secret style <laughs> or if it was just enough hard work that you convinced other people to get excited. How do you think you did it? Well, the first thing is sometimes, and this was really funny to me, I would see these articles of written about me uh, when Serafina first came out because it became a number one bestseller. Up to that point, no one had heard of me, of course, because I hadn't published any books prior to that. And so people, the headline was uh, instant success or overnight success. And I would just laugh and say, yeah, overnight success after 38 years of practice and rejections, <laughs> yes. Um, so basically, it just was an act of sheer will. Uh, it wasn't luck as much as just determination. And it wasn't even like great talent or anything. I wasn't born with any talent. In fact, the opposite. But I just worked really hard and kept practicing and improving. The only reason I was able to do that, though, was because I loved telling stories and I really, really, really wanted to be a writer. If, for example, you write a book and you, no one likes it and you don't really feel like doing it anymore, and it's just it's not in you to continue well that's your signal that it's best to stop but it's not because of the failure of the book you wrote it's more of what's in your heart in my opinion and my feeling was i just had to write i just had to write these stories i was going to write these stories whether for the rest of my life whether i got published or not not to say it wasn't important to me. I was always trying to get published, but I got to the point where I said, okay, even if I don't succeed in get, getting published, I'm going to keep telling stories. The other thing that was happening with me is I could tell that I was slowly improving because I could, I was talking to my readers. My readers were expand. The number of my readers were expanding. And so I could tell I maybe wasn't a good writer yet, but I was improving. Each book was getting better and better. So what's a, a quality work day, a good work day where you can go to sleep at night and say, Ooh, I did it today. What does that look like? Uh, well, mostly I, I write most of the day. So there are things that I need to do besides writing, of course. Uh, but I write pretty much from the time I get up to the time I go to bed. Uh, and if I can yeah, I don't count words where I say, okay, I need to write 500 words and those are done. Instead, I write a rough draft really fast and then I go through it again and again and again. And so it's more about refining and improving. I spend almost all my time revising rather than just writing the initial sentences. And so it's whether it's really I measure success on how many sentences and paragraphs and hopefully chapters I can get to the point where I'm satisfied that that's the best I can make that chapter uh, today. So I once I'm really clipping along and doing well, I try to complete that whatever phase I'm at, like if I'm in a refinement phase, I try to refine at least one full chapter each day and then go to the next one, next one, next one. Then I start over and become an even harder critic and refine it even further. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you're, and you, and you're, I mean, I'm assuming obviously you've got all kinds of business things that you need to do. You've got your family. I'm assuming Amy Adams is calling you up and saying, hey, we need to do this <laughs> the show. Uh, all kinds of stuff going on. Uh, do you write every day or do you take some days off? I write seven days a week generally. Uh, occasionally there'll be so much going on or things that I'm doing will get in the way and I won't be able to write. But generally I do write every day. So how long does it look like Will of the Dark Hollow take you to, to, to complete? It took me longer than my other books normally in the six books I've published thus far, it's been six years. And so it's one book per year. Now, when I say that, that doesn't mean that you actually have a full year to write the book because a publisher needs three to six months 
to uh, print the book, to get it into the channels, to, to market it, to get it to the bookstores and so on. So they, they would prefer to have a good six months. Uh, because of the schedule that we've been doing is quite tight, they're, they're really left with about three or four months, and I, I'm taking the nine months to write the book. Now, in the case of Willa of Dark Hollow, the pandemic disrupted the, the publication and my, my writing efforts last year, so that one took a little longer. That took about probably 14 months to write, and I was writing it during the pandemic. Did you have a period at all where you said, oh, my gosh, I, I read the news today, and now I'm overwhelmed, uh, so maybe I'll write tomorrow? Uh, no, I wouldn't give up generally like that, but I would struggle. I, the, the news would be overwhelming. It might be the pandemic. It might be politics. Uh, the rest of the world is a distraction to my writing. And so one of the strategies I have to employ is to disconnect from the outside world and try to become fully focused on the book. I really need to be obsessed with whatever book I'm writing in order to uh, succeed in writing it. And so I really need to get a certain level of detachment from the external world. In fact, it would be far easier to write books if the rest of the world was just boring. You know what I mean? If, if, if the rest of the world was boring, I, I would have a much better chance of writing more books more quickly. And I know you, you write out loud right? You, you, you say the sentences and, and hear them. Do you do that all the way through the revision steps as well? I do. So uh, for the audience who don't know exactly what you're talking about, let me explain. So when I'm writing a book, uh, let's say it's the first paragraph, I will type it out and then read the sentences to myself out loud. One, because that's the habit I got into with my daughters. But two, because that's just the way my brain thinks, is that I want to hear those words. I want to hear the pattern, the cadence, everything about those sentences. And I will work on, I'll work on a paragraph, sometimes even a single sentence for an entire day. And that's not at all unusual for me to work on one paragraph for a full day, get it done, and be happy at the end of that day. So sometimes people have said, wow, the words just flow out of you. That must be so nice. And I just laugh because it's like, okay, they don't flow. It's, it's hard work. It's the most difficult part for me. It's the most difficult part of writing, which is the construction of the sentences. Uh, and you say, well, what else is there? Well, there's the plot, there's the, the imagination, there's the developing the character, there's the reveals, there's, there's the structure, there's all these other things. I, I enjoy and can do those pretty readily. For me, the struggle is just getting good sentences in the right order. So, Do you plot ahead of time? I do. So I didn't when I started writing many, many years ago. But um, for many years now, I have been writing in such a way that I think up the story in my head and work on the entire story in my head. And then in many cases, I will f work on the story and find that it fails halfway through, or it doesn't have an interesting ending, or actually I've just created an entire story that's already been told many times or whatever, but I'll discover its weaknesses and I'll throw that out. Okay. I'll often work on three or four different story ideas at once in my head and just while I'm going about my life. And then I'll throw out the weakest ones and I'll start focusing on one and I'll get the whole story mapped out in my head. And then if I see it and I look at it while it's still in my head and I say, okay, if you do a good job writing that, that's going to be a decent story. And if I can get it to that point, then I sit down and I make I say, okay, part one, these chapters, part two, these chapters, here's the climax, here's the ending. So I outline the whole thing. And then once I've done all that, I start at chapter one and I just write it as fast as I can. Rough draft. Gotcha. 
And I, I hear that you're saying, if I do this right, if I manage to pull this off, but 69 weeks on the on the bestseller yeah. list, you don't have any kind of cockiness to say, hey, it's Robert Beatty time. I got this. No, not no. at all. No, no. Uh, let's see. So on the first book, you know, I had um, nothing but failure up to that point. On the second book, I was utterly terrified because I thought, okay, I wrote one good book, so I achieved my goal. <laughs> now I've got another, I need to write another one. How am I possibly going to do that? I was scared to death writing Serafina book two, which is Serafina and the Twisted Staff. And uh, I wrote it and I just said, because of the time crunch, I was in under, under a severe time crunch, much more so than any book I've written. Uh, I just said, okay, you can't, second guess yourself you even though you're scared you don't have time to second guess yourself or to double back or to have fear you need to just to plow through it and hope for the best so that's what i did and that did succeed now on the third one at that point i said okay you got this now let's up your game what you know you've you've proven that you were able to write two bestsellers two stories that people liked so what can you do in this third book what have you learned and what can you do to make it even better this time and so on my third one i think i enjoyed myself the most because i felt like Okay, you're, you know, you are a storyteller. People are wanting to read your book. They're waiting for you to finish it. So do the best job you can. And so I really enjoyed writing Seraphine and the Splintered Heart. That's the third book. Uh, and my daughters and I had a ball coming up with the plot. It has many twists and turns and reveals and betrayals. And uh, our strategy was something striking or revelatory needs to happen in every single chapter. So every chapter you need to go, Oh no, or, Oh my God, what's going to happen now? Uh, so every chapter is a twist or a turn or a new revelation. And so that was a fun one to write. And at that point, I was assuming, you know, what some of your readers are going to look like. You've heard feedback from them. You've got them in mind. Um, what's, uh, what's been your favorite reader reaction to, to one of your books so far? Uh, be more specific. What do you mean, reader reaction? Yeah, what uh, what have readers said or done in response to your book that's just kind of touched your heart? Or? Oh well, there's there's many many things. I have book signings, and the book signings are are very large, and I'll meet hundreds, sometimes thousands of my fans all in one day, and they'll they'll tell me about their experience, and it's really wonderful. I love meeting my fans. I'm generally an introvert, but I. The one thing I do like to do is talk to people about my books. And so I have many different situations, but one of my favorites is when a little girl will walk up to me with her mother and her grandmother, and all three of them will tell me simultaneously how much they love the story because they read it together, often out loud to each other. And to see that, to see a grandmother and her granddaughter or a mother and her son, that to me is just really awesome and cool to see that bond and to see that they have read the book together and had that shared experience. So I really love that. Uh, in many cases, Serafina and Willa of Dark Hollow are the are the first books that new young readers have read for pleasure on their own, and they've gotten through it on their own. Uh, not to say it's a beginner's book. It definitely is not. It's got a lot of serious intensity and serious vocabulary in it. So it's not what you would call an early reader chapter book. It's a true novel. But I love hearing from readers who maybe didn't really get into books that much. And then this is their first experience where they they had that wonderful experience of escaping into another world. So I love that as well. I've also met quite a few men and women who have walked up to me in signing book signing lines who have said, I'm 72 years old. I've never read a novel in my life until I read this one. This is the only novel I've ever read, the only book I've ever been able to get through, and I absolutely loved it. That's pretty cool. 
I really like talking to those people as well, because, you know, I've been there. I've struggled through books where I just didn't like the book and I just didn't read it. Um, and so when I write, I really try to write the book so that it's, it's accessible and will pull the reader in and keep the reader interested in what's going to happen next. And are you uh, a big reader currently? Do you, how much of your, of your week do you devote to reading? Uh, I do read quite a bit. I also listen to audiobooks a lot when I'm doing other things. Uh, so I would like to read more, but I read a ton of fiction and nonfiction. Yeah. Uh, and then I wanted to ask you about uh, assembling uh, your, your team. I, I, I think you've got uh, two publicists, uh, both of whom have been <laughs> lovely that I've spoken to. Uh, you've got your literary agent, you've got your TV, your film agents. I saw in the back of Will in the Dark Hollow, you're thanking three different freelance editors. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it must come from my CEO days or something. I don't know what, but I get a lot of help. So uh, let's talk about the freelance editors first. So uh, remember when I said I was a CEO and I had um, I didn't have much time and so on. Well, I discovered that you can uh, connect with people on the internet and you can find uh, professional editors, people who have worked at professional uh, publishing houses, and they are operating in a free freelance fashion now. And so you can employ them to read your book and provide uh, fee objective feedback. And so I got in the habit of doing that. And I would create little focus groups, little reader groups of these editors have them read my work and then provide me feedback all through the internet. And, and I would learn how to improve my writing by working with these editors. Some of them uh, were terrible and they provided me no benefit and I would drop them from my list. Others were mediocre, others were brilliant and really helped. And, and I still use them to this day. So I, once I work with the, once my daughters and my wife read the book and we work on it and refine it, the first thing I do is work with my freelance editors over the internet and through email and they give me their feedback. Um, I have one, I have some that I reuse on every book because, and I trust them and I have, but that's also dangerous because they, for lack of a better word, they like me too much now. In other words, we have a relationship now and we're friends in a way. And so I need to be careful about what they're telling me. So I also employ total strangers to read the book as well in order to get, and they have no idea who I am. And, and so they give me feedback in a totally fresh way and they don't care if they hurt my feelings or anything like that. They're more objective because they've not read any of my books before. So then uh, once I go through that process, as you can imagine, that takes a few months, I then give it to my editor at Disney and she reads it and we go through the process all over again. In the end, she is of course, my, my editor at Disney is of course the most important editor that I have and gives strong recommendations. And then uh, she never, she never writes anything or changes anything. Uh, and that's not what editors do. Instead, they say, well, have you thought about this? And well, maybe this part's a little weak. Maybe you could improve that part. You know, they give you criticism of what could be improved and maybe recommend some other ideas and that sort of thing. So then I take that and revise the book with that very important feedback as well. So for example, the book that I submitted to my editor at Disney, Stephanie, um, the, the book that eventually got published was quite different. I don't want, it wasn't drastically different. Like it wasn't that it changed the themes or the overall plot or anything like that. But a lot of big improvements were made by working with a good editor. So that's the editing side. I've always been very much involved with having people provide me feedback and then deciding how to respond to that. Again, they don't tell you how to write. They just tell you 
their experience in reading your material. And then you know where you need to improve. So, and then on the other thing is, yeah, I'm an entrepreneur by uh, sort of by spirit. And so one of the biggest things I learned in my entrepreneurial career in software was this idea that they, uh, if you build it, they will come, meaning that somehow the world's just going to magically know that you've written this book or that you've developed the software. That's false, right? The world's too big and too loud and complicated uh, for people to spontaneously discover you. You have to bring it to people's attention. And so that's why I have both publicists at Disney who work with all the other Disney authors. Uh, but I also have my own uh, publicists and managers here in Asheville. And we work hard to, to market and promote uh, my books. So for example, if it weren't for them, I wouldn't have time to find you and to speak with you. I would be too busy just focusing on my writing and only doing that uh, because that's my first love. Uh, but with the help of Scott and Lydia and Seal and Christine and, and the others that work with me, uh, they find opportunities and people for me to talk to and, and uh, help promote the book. And I mentioned that you, you're recording this from, I love that you have your own studio. Uh, so do yeah. they help you plan uh, programs for your YouTube channel as well? Uh, they, yes. So we work on that together. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, as you can tell from our discussion thus far, I love technology and software and all that kind of stuff. So when we started thinking about how can we reach people, what's the most efficient way to reach people, we had this idea of setting up a little YouTube studio in my workshop here. And so I now it's become one of my hobbies. So when I relax, I work on my YouTube studio, the cameras and the lighting and the video equipment and all that kind of stuff. I just find that to be fun. Given the way the, the passion and the gusto with which you throw yourself into things, I assume you're going to be doing this show, and then I'm going to be hoping to be a guest <laughs> on that. <laughs> yeah. uh, in fact, uh, we haven't even touched on this. I'm, I'm watching our time, and I know it's flying by, uh, so it's probably time to, to think about winding this down, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't ask uh, about robots, because you and your daughters on the side of everything else you're doing, you start building uh, robots to the point that they're being used around the world. And President Obama made a speech in which he said, you're a shining example of the American entrepreneurial spirit. And this is this is your side hustle, right? In, in, in 2014. Yes. <laughs> yes. So I'll tell you how that started. So again, when Camille, it was about the same time we started writing together. Camille was about 10 or 11 and she used to take things apart in the house and things like uh, remote controls and toasters and CD players and so on. She would just get a screwdriver and take them apart and bring them to me in pieces and say, what's this bit do, dad? What's this thing do? What's this little thing down here? And I would try to answer her questions the best I could, but I just started uh, YouTubing, uh, I'm sorry, started Googling a lot to try to answer her questions and eventually said, you know, Camille, it's awesome that you're curious about this stuff, but instead of taking everything apart, you know, we could actually build something. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about some little small thing and she said, I want to build a robot. And I'm like, okay, well, I don't know how to build a robot, but maybe we can figure that out. So we started watching YouTube videos and, and going to tech websites. We learned how to solder. We learned how to hook up wires. We started working with microcontrollers and then her sister joined in too. And we started making functional electronic projects and robots together in our garage. And we wanted to share it with uh, their cousins uh, that lived in a different state. And so we started putting videos uh, on a little website to show what our robots could do. And one day we were watching a documentary on the Mars rover on Spirit and Opportunity. And both my daughters just immediately said, Dad, we have to build that robot right there. We must build one of those. 
And so I took a breath and said, okay, well, I don't really know how to build a Mars rover, but let's see what we can figure out. So we just taught ourselves through the infinite knowledge of the internet, how to do all the different things, motors and and wiring and soldering. And eventually we started getting into machining metal so that we could make our own uh, custom metal parts. We started doing 3D printing, all sorts of different things. The only thing I could bring to the table was the, the software background that I had. And so that, that really helped. Um, but we learned the software language that you use uh, called Arduino, which is a microcontroller language. And one day we got a phone call from the New York Hall of Science, which is the premier science, hands-on science museum in New York City. And they said, we need, we have a big Mars exhibit, but uh, our little robot is sort of uh, pathetic and it's broken. Can you fix it? And we said, oh, well, I don't know, but send us some pictures. And we looked at it and we said, well, we don't want to fix that one, but how about we build you a new one? And they said, that's really why we were calling. That other part was just to trick <laughs> you into it. And so they said, we'd like to hire you, uh, you know, your daughters and yourself to build us a Mars rover for our exhibit. So if you go to the, uh, that was years ago. Uh, and if you go to the New York Hall of Science today in New York City, and you go to their Mars exhibit, there's two fully functional Mars rovers that look like Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, and they have sensors on them and cameras and you can drive them around and go explore their little Mars exhibit looking for signs of life. And they are in honor of who built them. Those robots are called Camille and Genevieve. And so after that, then we were on Fox News and Good Morning America, and then science museums all over the world started contracting us to build robots for them. And then President Obama heard about this and invited us to the White House and gave a big speech uh, where he uh, talked about the girls and how they're the, the spirit of entrepreneurialism in America and talked about the maker movement and, and so on. And it was really cool. So that's a very brief history of our work in robotics. So it started out just as a father-daughter quality time kind of thing, but very rapidly turned into a full-fledged company, which now none of us have enough time to actually operate. So we've had to sort of uh, suppress it and keep it from growing because I want to be writing books and uh, Camille is now in engineering school at Columbia uh, and so she's very busy doing that and Genevieve's very busy so we've had to sort of suppress the robotics company to keep it manageable for ourselves. They must, they must grow up with this idea that there isn't anything that they can't do. And why wouldn't they think that there isn't anything? That you That's right. And that was my goal, right? That was, that was what I was trying to do was just to say, you can do anything you can imagine doing. So is there a, a chance you think that we might see a Robert Beatty robot or sci-fi adventure novel at some point? Uh, I would like to write such a novel. I also like steampunk uh, a lot, uh, but I'm not sure the world's ready for that. I'm not sure that's what people want to read, but uh, maybe you'll get comments that it is what they want to read. I'm not sure. So, I suspect the, that if you wrote it, they would be very interested. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, this seems to be kind of a theme, and I, I've got about two more questions for you here, and, and okay. I'll call it a bit. This, uh, this, this, this is a cheat question, because it seems like this recurring theme that you get a little bit interested in something, and then a lot interested in something, and then it's, it's just a side project, but then you're chairman of the board. <laughs> yeah. uh, do you have an idea of, of what side hustles you might pursue while writing books in the future, or is it just something strikes your, your interest and we're off to the races? Okay, there... First of all, there's no randomness to it. So I, it's not that I bump into something and then it just takes me and I go with it. It's much more deliberate than that. And it's much more conscious than that. So, for example, the, the robotics thing, it, I told you how Camille started with it. And I'm, I was thinking, okay, do 
I want to spend my time doing this. And do I want my daughters to be doing this? And I thought about it and said, yeah, this, this would be really fun for us to work on it together because we would be excited about it and we'd be able to work together and let's see where it takes us. And then as we go farther with it and it's like, do we want to build robots for museums? Do we want to go to the white house? You know, all that stuff is, is does it seem like a good path for us and for me and for my daughters? And that's why we would pursue it. And so there's no uh, haphazardness or randomness to it. It, it, it is deliberate because I thought this is a great way for my daughters and I to bond and get closer together, but it's also good for their minds and their sense of the main thing I wanted to show them was, okay, I was the CEO of an internet software company, but I did not know how to build a robot. I did not know how to solder. I did not know how to wire microcontrollers. I did not know how to machine parts on a lathe or a mill. But with YouTube, we figured it out, okay? In other words, with YouTube and the internet in general, it's the entirety of human knowledge is there. And you can go for it and teach yourself whatever you want to learn about. And that's really the lesson I wanted them to learn was that, that they have this huge resource out there and they are in, that makes them almost all powerful, meaning they can see what they want to do and go after it and achieve that dream. And so that was a very deliberate choice on my part that I thought, okay, this is going to be uh, a good path for the girls to go on. Now, one of them ended up, I, I did not tell them, you know, you must go into engineering or something like that. I, I don't do that. But one of them did go into engineering. I, in fact, just out of responsibility, tried to persuade her not to. I said, well, what about all the other things you like? You're a really good writer. Maybe you could be a writer. You know, I purposely played devil's advocate to see if I could convince her not to be an engineer. And she wasn't having it. Camille wanted to be an engineer more than anything else. And that's what she is today. And then Genevieve went what to some people is the opposite, but to, in my family, is just a different branch of the same thing. She went to art school and is studying to be a designer and an artist. So they seem the opposite, but again, in my family, they are related subjects. Well, I'm, uh, I've got two more questions for you because we're, we're sure. running over uh, time just a little bit and I appreciate you being so incredibly generous uh, with your time this evening. My first question, a little bit trite, but esteemed audience knows I ask everybody and I'm not gonna chicken out. <laughs> Uh, okay. Have you, Robert Beatty, ever seen a flying saucer and or a ghost? I have not seen either of those two things. I would like to, but I haven't seen those. So I've looked at the recent uh, UFO sightings, you know, from the Navy and so on. And I was excited about those because the pilots saw something that really impressed them. Uh, and that part impresses me. But when I look at the video images that they have thus far, I wasn't that impressed. I, it, it doesn't look like an aircraft to me. It looks like a, a flaw on the lens or something like that. And yet those pilots say there was something physically there. So that is pretty compelling. And then as for the ghost question, I've not seen any ghosts. I wish I had because it would make my stories better. Uh, <laughs> well, I, would, I, just wondered, I know you spend a lot of time out. In fact, you're a state licensed wildlife. Uh, what, what, what's the full title? Yeah, so uh, I am a state licensed wildlife rehabilitator, which means that I went through training to have a license such that uh, people can bring me wounded and sick animals like a hawk with a broken wing or a owl or maybe a wounded fox or something like that. And then I can nurse them back to health and release them back to the wild. 
And I was doing that quite actively right up until Seraphine and the Black Cloak got published. And then that was one of the things that unfortunately I had to do less of because I really needed to focus on writing. So I still have my license, but I, I'm not real active at this point. But prior to Seraphine and the Black Cloak, yeah, we had uh, all sorts of animals in our care at any one time. So hawks and other birds and possums and, and all sorts of different different animals. I was hoping so, that uh, all that outside time might get you looking up at just the right moment. <laughs> yeah, right, yes. Do you no. ever play a video game or binge watch a television series? <laughs> uh, let's see, I don't play video games at all, and uh, neither do my kids, but I do binge watch series. I love movies. So um, my wife and I are opposites in this regard. When she's tired, she wants to go to bed. She doesn't want to watch a movie. When I'm tired after working all day, I'm like, oh, I'll be working on my book all day. And then I'll say, oh, okay, I'm tired. I'm going to go watch a movie. So that's what I do when I'm tired, you know, and uh, a movie or a television series. The, the new, it's a new golden age of television where the television series are super high quality and they're nice and long. And so they can really develop the characters in a way movies can't. So I like both good, high quality television series as well as movies. I'm looking forward to Willa uh, of the Wood becoming for two seasons yeah. and then Willow the Dark Hollow. For, that's going to sound like it's going to be an amazing series. I hope it is. Yeah, we're working on it, working hard on it. Well, my uh, last question for you, uh, and, and, and for real this time, I won't sneak any more in, but thank you that's okay. so much. This has been just amazing. And I'm looking forward to going back and listening to this again and again, because there's all kinds of amazing advice in here that I'm going to enjoy uh, digesting. Um, but my, my final question for you is always some variation. Uh, if you could go back to any point you like, all the way back to age 11 when you got the typewriter or somewhere where you're writing the novels or even, you know, last week, wherever you like, if you could go back and give yourself some advice that would have made a significant difference in your journey toward publication and writing uh, and might make a significant difference in the journey of all those who are listening to us, what would you go back and tell yourself? Well, uh, I'll answer it more towards the people that are listening than to myself, but I would say the main thing is if you are writing stories and you enjoy writing stories, then just keep doing it. Try to write every day or every other day and write your story, give it to some people, listen to what they're saying and then write another one and just keep doing it. It's a learned skill. It's like being a mechanic or a construction worker or a software programmer. It's something that has a set of skills and capabilities that you need to develop and you need to develop all of them. So it took me a, lo a long time to realize, I kept thinking, what am I missing? There must be something I'm missing here. And it's just that none of my skills in any of the different areas were, were sufficient, but with practice and learning, uh, I eventually developed those skills, just like you would if you needed to learn how to fix cars, you have to, you have to learn it. It's a, it's a physical, mental skill. And so don't think that it's something you're either born with, you either have it or you don't. It's not like that. It's a skill. Also, it's not, for most writers, it's not an easy thing. It doesn't just like magically pour out of your brain uh, in that way. So for example, if you read a paragraph in one of my books and you think that's a really nice paragraph, that's, he's so lucky that that can just flow out of his brain. I guarantee you, I spent hours working on that paragraph to get it to sound the way it sounds. So don't think that it's just some magical thing that you don't have. If you want it, go get it. Where can esteemed audience find you online, follow you on social media, all that good stuff? Yeah, so Robert Beatty Books, that's B-E-A-T-T-Y. So it's robertbeattybooks.com. Uh, that's my website. And then um, I'm very active on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube. And it's Robert Beatty Books. Uh, and as always, esteemed audience, for all of the best interviews with all of the best people, head to middlegradeninja.com. Download your free copy of Banneker Bones and the Giant Robot Bees. 
and God willing, I'm alive. I'll see you next week.